Good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Victoria Memorial Hall with profuse, profuse apologies for this delayed start. Uh, when you are at an airport and a flight is delayed by an hour or an hour and a half, uh, there's nothing that one can do about it. You just wait and they t tell you that it was because of the late arrival of the incoming aircraft or due to technical reasons. We are not presenting any kind of excuses of that sort. Uh, the reason for the delay today is very simple, a kind of mantra that we as Indians always believe in, and that is Atiti Devo Bhava. And, and uh, our guest, uh, Dr. Hartwig Fisher, is for the first time in Calcutta. And uh, as you all know that this city has this tendency of growing on you, and yes, it grew on him very fast. And right from this early morning, he has been having a series of programs of visiting places. And this Atiti Devo Bhava attitude at each place has <laughs> delayed him by half an hour to 45 minutes and set him back because everyone wanted to go overboard with hospitality wherever he went. And uh, I am sure that uh, he would cherish all that uh, for years to come now. So we are very glad that we have Dr. Hartwig Fisher with us. And we are also very glad that you have shown such tremendous patience in waiting for this lecture to start this afternoon. So he's going to present an illustrated lecture on building, destroying, forgetting, discovering, understanding, and healing. My humble effort was at the last one of that, of healing this kind of ruptured patience of yours for this afternoon. And the uh, Cultural Heritage and the Encyclopedic Museum. And uh, we are very glad to have you with us, sir. But before you start, may I request Dr. Jayantra Sengupta to kindly introduce the speaker for this afternoon, after which we'll go straight into the presentations. Good afternoon, everybody, and a warm welcome to today's lecture and sincerest apologies for the delayed start. It's an absolute privilege and honor for us in the Victoria Memorial Hall to have with us Dr. Hartwig Fisher, uh, the director of perhaps the largest and most important museum of human history and culture, the iconic British Museum. Uh, Dr. Fisher is one of the truly outstanding leaders <coughs> of the international museum community and after spending uh, quite a few years in the museum profession in Basel and then in Dresden where he was a director of a cluster of 14 museums since 2016 he has been heading a museum which we have always looked up to as a beacon of light in everything from collection and curation to research educational activities, outreach, and visitor management. Museums in India, including the Victoria Memorial Hall and the Indian Museum, have had a long and deep relationship with the British Museum. Uh, several of my colleagues in these two museums, present in this room, were trained in the British Museum in a under a program called the Leadership Training Program. In a sense, therefore, to welcome Dr. Fisher to India, and to this museum is to welcome him back to museums that have the British Museum organically built into their histories. Uh, Dr. Fisher is on a short trip to Kolkata. Originally, he was supposed to stay in the city for only about 32 hours, rushing off to the airport straight from this lecture. Uh, but it turns out that Jet Airways, Jet Airways has kindly or otherwise uh, have added a few more hours to it. Uh, but he readily agreed at the very beginning to take time out from his busy and high energy trip to give this lecture here. So on my personal behalf and on behalf of the Victory Memorial Hall and everybody else present in this room, I thank you from the core of our hearts. Uh, as you have seen in the brief video that was played a few times uh, before this, Dr. Fisher talks about the museum space as a space for shelter and refuge where objects that have lost their homes or, or their worlds, as it were, find a new refuge or home. And it is through that process that the museum becomes a world country that transcends national borders or concepts of indigeneity and alienness. Today's lecture also talks about a transnational subject and project, the discovery of the ancient Assyrian civilization through 19th century excavations 
the building of Assyrian galleries in various great museums of the West, and the subsequent building of the National Museum of Baghdad in the 20th century, its destruction through the 1990s and 2000s, owing to military conflict and fundamentalism, and now its rescue and rehabilitation made possible through the collaboration with some of the great museums and research institutes of the world and with the financial support of foundations and governments of numerous countries. It's an important story that is instructive for us in today's conflict-ridden world where we have a shared responsibility for saving and protecting the common cultural heritage of humankind. Dr. Fisher's lecture is fascinatingly titled Building, Destroying, Forgetting, Discovering, Understanding, Healing, Cultural Heritage and the Encyclopedic Museum. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hartwig Fisher. Good afternoon and thank you very much indeed for your kind words of introduction and welcome. Um, on behalf of my colleague, Ima Ramos, um, who's curator in the India uh, section of the British Museum and myself, I would first of all like to thank you for these incredible intense moments in um, this extraordinary city. Um, we had the, the great fortune of visiting the Indian Museum and um, uh, seeing uh, its distinguished director yesterday for first walk through this um, unrivaled collection and Dr. Sengupta then at the um, Victoria Memorial Hall. Uh, unforgettable moments and today through the city to uh, a number of sites. So forgive me for being late. It's the fault of your city and the warmth and and generosity and hospitality that you've all shown us. Uh, we feel extremely um, privileged and, and indeed um, not like gods, but almost. <laughs> now, Dr. Sengupta has beautifully summed up my um, speech, so I can go straight ahead into questions and answers, if you like. Um, but I will nevertheless um, take you through a couple of slides. And um, the first one shows you uh, what you all know, the British Museum, in its present um, form and shape. Um, the British Museum was founded through an act of Parliament in 1753, the first museum to be founded by Parliament, um, and one of the early museums. Um, uh, Parliament had then to find um, a house for the collection of Hans Sloan. That's the collection Parliament bought to create the British Museum. Um, the collection of uh, uh, a distinguished physician, um, scholar, um, researcher, adventurer, entrepreneur, um, very successful man, um, who early on went to Jamaica uh, and laid the foundations there to his um, collection of um, natural history artifacts and um, books, uh, which grew into one of the greatest private collections of its kind. Um, Sloan um, lived to um, be 93 and um, had the foresight of contacting um, Parliament to offer his collection for £20,000, which was way below the market price. But he wanted to make sure that Parliament, should Parliament accept, take this business serious, seriously. Um, otherwise, he said, it might as well go to St. Petersburg or Paris or Amsterdam or some other place interested in such a collection. So he was not, it was not for him um, a national or patriotic um, project in the first place. He wanted this collection as um, a unique representation of the world to be preserved for future generations. Parliament bought it, then um, organized a lottery which was famously corrupt to uh, buy the first building, Montague House, and that's on Great Russell Street. Um, that's where the collection was housed. Um, together with three libraries that were joined together for the occasion. Um, and um, as I said, it comprised um, 
natural history and um, human history. Now that building grew, uh, or the, 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 the collection very quickly outgrew the, the space. It got very crowded and there are many complaints by visitors of the late 18th century to the collection who were ushered through the rooms which were packed with material um, without having the time to um, study. Now when you visit the museum today, you do no longer see Montague House. The British Museum um, that you see today was planned by Robert Smirk in the 1820s and built until 1956, 1856 um, when um, the round reading room was added as the last part of the building project, decided fairly um, late in the project. Um, but even, you know, opening one wing after the other, it soon turned out that the library needed more space. So um, the, um, the director of that time, um, Panizzi, said, let's build a round reading room in the courtyard, a tough luck for the courtyard, and our visitors who will not have a space to um, um, sit quietly and let it sink in, but we will build the reading room. Um, the, the museum was founded on very progressive principles, as you can see here. This is from the um, British Museum Act of 1753. And what this preamble um, stipulates is that the museum work in an interdisciplinary way, bringing together um, um, different regions of knowledge, um, science, and research, that it works in an innovative way, and that it creates public good. And I think that is um, very important. It's a parliament that creates a new institution to create public good. It's not a prince who opens parts of his collection in an act of uh, magnanimity to his subjects. It's Parliament creating something for the public. Um, this is the um, courtyard um, now freed of um, the, um, the buildings that contained the book stacks, 82 miles of books, bookshelves in the end. Um, and the Round Reading Room has been the place of um, scholarship um, for a long time. Many great minds worked here um, until 1996 when the library finally left the premises to move into their new building near St. Pancras. In that moment, the British Museum had to think, what are we going to do with this space now? Um, and in view of the millennium um, celebrations, the decision was taken to um, build a roof and use the space as circulation area, place for cafes and place for people to, to, to rest and, um, um, and prepare their visit. Now when you walk into um, this beautiful courtyard, um, you come across this inscription. and let thy feet millennium's hands be set in midst of knowledge, which is from a poem by um, Alfred Lord Tennyson. Um, the two voices, which he wrote after the death of his close friend, um, Arthur Henry Hallam, in 1833-34. And the two voices, it's a long poem, over 10, 12 pages, um, is actually a dialogue between the voice of negation, the voice of nihilism, and the voice of, let's say, um, an affirmative voice, a voice which is turned to life and affirms life and human existence. And that second voice has great difficulties in the beginning to make itself heard and to find its pace and its arguments, because the voice of negation is extremely powerful and rhetorically um, very versed. And in fact, this beautiful inscription, which is a dedication of this space, and let thy feet millennium's hands be set in midst of knowledge, that is what the museum is meant to do. That's the dedication of the museum. That's the mission of the museum. When you look at the poem, um, 
has quite a different context. For run thy peers thy time, and let thy feet millenniums hence be set in midst of knowledge, dream not yet. Thou hast not gained a real height, nor art thou nearer to the light, because the scale is infinite or infinite. In other words, you can do whatever you want. You can study as much as you want. You will never, ever really understand, because the realm of what it, there is to be known is simply unfathomable. You will never come to terms with this. Now, I think that it is quite a strong gesture for a museum, even though perhaps the person who found this line and let thy feet millenniums hence, etc., did not know the whole poem, but perhaps found this in the Oxford English Dictionary under millennium. We need something for millennium. Could be, I don't know, I haven't asked. But the fact is that you have those two dimensions. You have the um, you have the affirmation of knowledge and the affirmation of the museum as as an institution that offers knowledge to people from all walks of life. And on the other hand, um, that conundrum of a museum as any institution of knowledge never ever being able to come to terms with what it really talks about. Now, this museum, the British Museum, is in the process of um, planning a capital project. We need to renovate the building and in doing so we want to redo the display of our collections, which as you know um, right now are uh, rather neatly siloed. You have Egypt, you have Assyria, you have Greece, China, India, Japan, and so forth. Um, what we want to do, what we would like to achieve, is to make our visitors much more aware of how closely intertwined cultures have been throughout the millennia. So that when you look, for instance, at Egypt, or Greece, or Persia, that you understand that this is one huge cultural space. That when you look at India, you also think of Persia, and you think of China, and the list goes on and on. I think the museum today, an encyclope encyclopedic museum today, must address these um, dimensions. We call it the Rosetta Project thinking of the most visited object in the museum, which talks about the role of the museum as a translator between cultures. Um, and as a place where people who come here, curious and keen to learn, acquire the possibility to activate cultural resources, which is the key, obviously, of having a culture. Perhaps more than simply growing into a culture. What you make, what you call you own, your own, you must have made your own. So the Rosetta project is a, proje a project of translation. It's a trans the museum as a translational space on so many levels. And of course the Rosetta project is also a project that reminds us that this stone has an origin and it has a history. It was created, it, it's, it's a, you know the text, the text is not particularly spectacular, it's a, it's a government decree. Um, of uh, 197 BCE um, about certain tax privileges that were granted to a temple and it was set up in a temple and then later when people um, no longer knew what to, what to do with it, it was used as building material um, um, to create a fort on the riverbanks um, in the Nile Delta in Rashid and that's where um, the scholars who followed Napoleon on his um, invasion uh, in Egypt, discovered it and understood immediately, obviously, that 
because you have the hieroglyphs, demotic and Greek on one surface, um, that this was the key to deciphering the hieroglyphs, uh, which generations had attempted in vain. Now, the British were not particularly happy about the French presence in Egypt because it, it, it could have jeopardized their possibility to reach out. And obviously the, the, the presence um, of Great Britain in India was, was, was a major concern in this. They fought the French, and in the capitulation of Alexandria in 1801, um, got hold of the ship that the French had already filled with antiquities to bring them to Paris, among them the Rosetta Stone. The French had published, had not published, they had reproduced the text of the Rosetta Stone, but that had, they had not shared it. So rumors spread that there must be this stone, and we've heard that it might be the key to deciphering the hieroglyphs, but nobody was able to get hold of it. As soon as the stone arrived in London, George III gave it to the British Museum. The British Museum reproduced the text and distributed the reproduction of the text among the learned societies and universities um, of um, Europe and um, North America. And we all know who made the race. It was the French with Champollion, who published in 1822 his first major work on the decipherment of the hieroglyphs. This is just a, to, to remind you of that um, complex um, history. And I jump back to this pediment of the British Museum, um, where you see on the left, man being lured out to protect what could not be moved out of these um, um, galleries into other premises, more secure places. Um, they, they had covered them with sandbags. The same they did in the Second World War, and this time, uh, during the Blitz, this, the British Museum was hit, um, but um, no damage um, was caused um, to the collections that had remained in place. So today, as in the past, in this reading room, the cuneiform reading room, scholars from around the world meet to continue 